So welcome back, Jerry. Welcome back, Jason. Glad to see you. Likewise, likewise. So what are we talking about today? Today, it's all about zero trust architectures. So I think we're just going to go into to the third chapter of the book and, and really just talk about some of the stuff we put in there and, and address uh, maybe some questions you may be having, uh, address some of the, the, cons the concerns we had or, or, or just some of the challenges around the enterprise architecture and, and what Zero Trust brings to that. that that's my thoughts. I think it makes sense. And there are a lot of challenges around this. I mean, you and I work with enterprises all the time. Um, and I'm always amazed at the huge range of complexity and surprisingly some sorts of uh, unexpected challenges that folks have, oftentimes with legacy architectures or legacy networks. And as they try to make their way towards zero trust, it's some things seem to work very easily and other things are really thorny problems that folks really struggle to get uh, their heads around sometimes. And um, I think sometimes it's simple where it's, okay, we're just doing a VPN replacement to start with. And we got this known group of users, users and the policies are very straightforward. And other times it's, okay, we've got this really complicated international global network and we've got duplicate IP addresses that we have to deal with. And no one really knows how it, all these things are connected sometimes. It can be really a real challenge as they very thoughtfully try to make their way down this journey and improve things one step at a time without breaking things. Yeah, no doubt. And, and quite frankly, I mean, how often do you go in and you talk to an organization that's really greenfield? Uh, very, very rarely, uh, especially when you start talking about the, the large enterprise organizations where they do, do have just what you said, this large enterprise architecture that's already defined legacy hardware, legacy applications that though they may be legacy, it's still foundational and core to their business and their business processes. So we, we, have, to, we have to start addressing, addressing that. It, it is, and a lot of it has to do with the character of the business as well, where we've got, I remember talking to some fairly substantial banks, retail banks, and even though they were very large, their network was well understood because they had a, a medium-sized headquarters and it was reasonably well done, and they had hundreds and hundreds of branches, and all the branches were architected in exactly the same way. Now, they were what we call legacy, they were very knack heavy and weren't zero trust at all, but there wasn't a lot of complexity because they were all the same. Now, they had lots of overlapping IP address ranges, which was another problem. But you know, for them, it was a, a, a really well-contained problem. And you compare that with, say, some of the larger enterprises that are global and are very messy and very, very heterogeneous because it's not like the, they have 100 bank branches that are, or 1,000 bank branches that are the same. They've got hundreds of offices, and every single one is different. No, absolutely. And, and, and my, my favorite question, even to date, is, has been, you know, how do we start? I, I've got this large architecture. I've got this big thing. Here's all the stuff. How do we start this conversation? So I, I say we just pull up our, our first, uh, our, our enterprise architecture di diagram, that just representative of what's, uh, what's in the environment, and, and just talk through some of those challenges that's, that's just there, because I think it's representative of a lot of organizations. Exactly. Okay. So Let's take a look at, at, at this diagram. And clearly what we tried to do was to portray here a representative, yes, it's oversimplified, but at the same time, it is representative of a mixture of different technologies and different uh, network topologies and deployments of things that might be in place in a typical enterprise. And you know, real enterprises, of course, are a hundred times more complex than this, but this at least hints at some of the challenges and some of the things they have with different networking and security components all over the place. Yeah, I mean, if you take a look at it, you see, that, you know, obviously the VPNs on there, you've got, uh, you know, a common challenge I talk to clients about, and, and it's just really common is, is, well, you know, it's great if, I, if I'm if i on my network and, and I've, I'm routing all my traffic through, say, a traf uh, through a CASB just to get out to the internet, right? That's a very common, well, that's great for for uh, my internal network, but once I ex once I go off of that, you know, in the in the situation we've been in for the last couple of years, uh, or the last I, it feels like a couple of years, but uh, for the last year and a half, really, is is around the um, uh, the remote from uh, work from home, the remote workforce, and and how do I still instantiate and make sure that the the traffic that's being routed through my network is is successful without just agents sitting on my on my computer? Uh, so there's there's challenges around that, and how do I how do I manage that? Um, and, and, and just how do I get, um, how do I give access to my resources on-prem? 
right? Because, you know, going, working from home, you still have all these resources that may not be SaaS based. There are infrastructure as a service. There, there's certainly going to be uh, resources that is 100% on-prem that sit in a data center somewhere that still has to be protected through zero trust. And I, I think this uh, enterprise architecture really, you know, fleshes out, you know, what are the what are the different components that really drive those conversations with between the NACs, as you said, between the load balancers, between the 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 WAFs, the you know, link to you know, the VPN or the site to site links to, you know, um, uh, your SaaS or your, your cloud service providers. I think all of those elements are really representative here. Again, to your point, I think it's simplified, but it's certainly represented here. Yeah. And I think the load balancers in particular are always interesting because there's so many different types of load balancing and things can operate at different levels. So when you're having these conversations or when we're having these conversations with enterprise architects and security folks, it always requires uh, thought and a deeper understanding of how they're going to deploy it. So you look at a, this diagram and say, okay, great. Well, we've got a load balancer. Okay, well, how is it working? Is it using DNS? Is it working at the network layer? Is it stateful or stateless? What happens in the event of failure? What type of application is this? And then you want to map that to the understanding of how your, your, your chosen zero trust architecture and its policy enforcement point is going to work. And what's the traffic routing look like? How does DNS work? What's the user experience going to be? What happens when this component fails or that component fails? And it's you know all these pieces that have to be well understood and put together. And that's why zero trust is such a, a challenging, interesting, and you know, sometimes very hard journey because you built this very intricate structure of these complicated enterprise architectures as they exist today, and you're changing things, but yet you have to keep it running at the same time. Yeah, and you know, you called something out. It's and it goes back to the you know my question or, or an earlier question is, you know, if you look at these load balancers, balancers, how do they fit in a zero trust architecture? Are they a policy enforcement point? Are they a part of that architecture? Um, a, a common question: Are we doing a lift and shift of all of our network? Which is absolutely ridiculous <laughs> at the end of the day, but at the same time, it's a it's a question that people are asking, and I think it's it's totally a um, a fair point to show that you know a load balancer though it may be in the this architecture and it's going to be in your zero trust architecture moving forward uh, may not be a PEP or a policy enforcement point, um, but it may really depending on what you're trying to accomplish and how it, how it communicates across the enterprise. Yes, yes, and that's that same those same types of questions and the same thoughtful consideration clearly is going to apply to all of the other types of things in that diagram as well, whether it's a a PAM or a jump box or a NAC, etc. And that's. You know, clearly why in part two of the book we go through and we enumerate all of these technologies and we do a you know, hopefully thoughtful and credible analysis of the impact of doing this and the pros and cons of doing things. Uh, so let's let's talk about um, kind of the zero trust architecture from a higher level perspective. And I like, or we like, uh, when we do this to, to, to reference the NIST 800-207 document. And if you look at this diagram here, uh, which is from that document, um, what it shows is it introduces some of the concepts and uh, the conceptual building blocks of, of zero trust from this perspective. So why don't you, uh, why don't you introduce that, Jerry? Yeah, I mean, I think it it does a great job of of introducing the the core concepts, right? If you think of you know what's in the in the middle of that with the PDP uh, or the policy decision point, bringing in you know all this this external data into defining what policy looks like, defining how you implement, or, or more importantly, how you, you structure your zero trust um, architecture or, or just your policies, right? Because that's really what that's driving towards. So bringing in all that external data is, is a fantastic way to support that. And if you look at that, that sits up at a control plane where you're managing what's happening. That control plane is where, where the, the policies are defined, where PDPs are talking to PEPs. That's not a user accessing a resource, which is really further down in that, that data plane. And if you see the one thing here that, that I think I like to call out quite a bit is the, the PDP is in constant communication with the PEP or the policy enforcement point. And having that, that back and forth communication throughout a user session, throughout an access request, throughout anything you're doing in the zero trust architecture is, is really important. Jason, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, what I what I like about this diagram is it introduces these core concepts, but it does so in a way that's independent of the actual deployment model, which we'll be talking about later. Uh, but it introduces a couple of key concepts. So one is separation of the control plane and the data plane. 
the notion of a policy decision point that acts as the brain and will then delegate the actual enforcement and let the policy enforcement point know effectively, hey, this subject should get allowed to be allowed to access these resources at this time under these circumstances. But what it also does is, if you look at the boxes down on the left and the right hand side, these are representative of the types of inputs that are necessary, that we believe are really necessary for a zero trust architecture. Because if you think back for a minute on the representative enterprise architecture we showed, you've got lots of different networking and security components in there. And those things were designed and deployed differently, separately. They were probably built by different companies, different vendors, and they don't talk to each other. And that's one of the biggest problems that Zero Trust helped solve is breaking down silos between enforcement points at the network and application level and the ability for helping the enterprise have an easier way to define a policy model that uh, works across this very heterogeneous infrastructure and really simplifies things. And this first diagram here from NIST you know, kind of puts a stake in the ground and says, okay, in order for a zero trust model to work, you need to be able to have input both from a data and an event perspective from a continuous diagnostics and, and monitoring system, a threat intelligence system, logs from other components, obviously your identity system, a PKI system, if you're using that, um, some sort of maybe a data policy or a SIM system. And there's a good half a dozen others, major systems that we believe need to be integrated with a zero trust model to really tie all this together and to allow it to be effective for all subjects accessing all resources under all circumstances, which is really the mission and the scope of zero trust. Yeah, and you said something I've, I've, I talk about a lot and it's very critical and key to this um, is tearing down those silos, right? Bringing the silos down from, from your identity and your security and your data and all those products just to, to bring that down to define what, it, that helps define what Zero Trust is, right? And, and it helps uh, uh, create or, or foster a Zero Trust architecture. Exactly. So let's, let's talk about these policy enforcement points because in many yeah. ways they're the crux the one, one big piece of what, what has to happen here. And if you look at this diagram here, so this diagram is from, uh, is from the book where we really introduce three types uh, or three classes of policy enforcement points. Um, you've got the user agent PEP, which is in many circumstances running on a user's device, not all. And most zero trust vendors have a clientless or an agentless deployment model. But you know, for many cases, there is a user agent PEP. There's a network PEP or one or more network PEPs that sit and do enforcement at the network layer. But then there's the concept of application PEPs, which do enforcement at the application layer. There's very often a fuzzy line between these that when we talk about the deployment models and when we talk later about the policy model, we'll, we'll, we'll start to talk about some of the nuances and the subtleties there. Yeah, Jason, I think that's all great. I think what we should do is let's go to that next slide here. Let's just talk about that one because I think, you know, looking at the next slide really kind of highlights that. I think the the fact that we have, you know, these 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 three classifications of PEPs and, and then starting to break them down into, you know, what are they, right? If you think about on-prem physical stuff, you get the on-prem virtual environment, you have the cloud environment, whether it's IaaS or PaaS. Um, you have your containerization, and if you have your IoT, I mean, all of those are different types of PEPs. One piece that's not on here that I that, that I think I want to call out is is my mobile device, right? It may not just be a a, a device that's issued by um, my organization, but it could be a my 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 phone, my mobile device, my Android, my iPhone, whatever that happens to be. And, and we even have talk about a PEP being there as well. Um, so having a PEP across all of those those uh, environments are are, are really core. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, so the reason that we like this diagram when we brought it up is that it, I think it, it captures the essence of what's in the NIST document, but it makes it clear that you at the bottom layer here have in a typical enterprise, a huge variety of different types of resources that are under enterprise control and that it's the responsibility of the security team to manage access to all those, whether it's on-prem physical or virtual in various cloud environments, et cetera. Um, and all of those things have very different deployment mechanisms and they certainly run in different types of technology. And that's gonna 
require a pretty wide variety of policy enforcement point mechanisms. And the interesting thing about, thing about this diagram is we didn't say, is this a network path or an application path? We didn't say, you know, is it running in which any of those four deployment models? Because this diagram is really a logical one. What it says is you need to have a mechanism that has enforcement across this very different, very uh, wide ranging set of technology. And you simplify that by having a single logical zero trust policy model that sits on top of that. And what that does all of a sudden is one, it breaks down those silos because now I don't have to have a separate type of access control list or model for on-prem versus remote users, for cloud-based resources versus on-prem virtualized resources, et cetera. The idea is that the policy enforcement points will take care of that mapping for you. And it gives the security team a single policy model breaking down the silos in reducing the friction and the, the impedance mismatch between these different layers. And it gives them a very rich identity centric vocabulary for expressing those policies in a way that was not possible before. No, I think that's all fantastic. And if you actually look at this, I really like the fact that how you, you do you still have that PDP up there and it's actually, you can see that communicating through that policy model. I think that policy model to your point, very important and it, and it shows that that's a single policy model that may span multiple technologies, right? We, we know there's multiple technologies going to do this, but you're going to have a policy model that's ultimately going to drive that and help define that so that these PEPs can dynamically manage and enforce those policies as, as uh, regardless of where you happen to be, whether you're on-prem, in the cloud, on advice, you know, whatever that looks like. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's one of the other core principles of Zero Trust is if you think about one of the reasons that we believe enterprises are struggling so much today with security is because you have these silos and because you have complexity and you have the inability to have a simple centralized way of expressing access rules that gets uniformly applied and automatically applied across all these environments. And that's really what's been in many ways, I think, impeding the effectiveness of security organizations in and in today's threat, very heightened threat landscape, the, the results are not pretty. And zero trust promises and delivers on the ability to get rid of that complexity and to automate this type of enforcement and make organizations a lot more resilient to the kind of rampant ransomware and, and other types of attacks that are ongoing today. No, I, th I think that's all fantastic. So I think uh, the last thing we should just hit on here, Jason, is is really that policy model. Uh, but let's, we... Before we do that, let's, sorry, let's, uh, no, fine, yeah. Going back up to this diagram, uh, what's also important in that NIST hints at it, and we make it a little bit more explicit here, is that the policy decision point needs to have the ability to connect to a variety of things. So the eight boxes on either side of the NIST diagram we show on the upper left here. So things like your SIM or an IT service management service desk or CMDB threat intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. And the key is that your zero trust system and its policy model needs to be able to interface and integrate with those, not only to push and pull context, uh, let's say to pull context to be able to make more informed access decisions, but also to have an event model that uh, is tie, that ties those things together. We talk about this a bunch in our security orchestration, our security operations chapter as well, where if a endpoint detection system or a SIM detects, hey, something strange is going on on this particular device or in this particular network segment, it needs to be able to initiate that event and make an API call or send a message to the policy decision point in the zero trust system and tell it, hey, something's wrong over here or something's up over here, do something about it. And then the zero trust system can take action in response to that. And that's the beauty of this thing of tying these things together, both from a data and an event perspective. Uh, and which, which leads back to the, the policy model. So let's talk about those different components. And um, just as a, as a ref refresher, uh, the main components are, of course, you have the subject, which is the entity, whether it's a human or non-human, that's actually taking the action here and for whom you're evaluating the policy. And then you have the assignment criteria that basically say, okay, this subject has been authenticated. So uh, let's determine to which identities this particular policy is gonna apply. And this can be something as simple as entities that are a member of this particular directory group, or it could be more complicated such as people who have this certain level of security clearance and are in a certain location during a certain time of day. Then you have the action, which is 
what's the resource they're trying to attach to or make use of? Um, and how is that resource identified, whether it's a host name or some other mechanism for identifying the target? And then finally, there's this more real-time condition, which is, okay, what are the circumstances under which they really should be allowed to access this? So those are really the ingredients of the policy. And I know, Jerry, as you work with prospects and customers, you know, what's their, what's their reaction to this? What types of conversations do you have when you're explaining this conceptually? Yeah, no, that's a, you know, a lot of clients, they love the concept. Everyone I talk to is that it's, it's a great concept. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, what my typical uh, reaction to the customers is how do we get, um, and, and we're both pro product agnostic when we talk about zero trust, but how do we get a product to do this? Because that's immediately when I talk to a CISO or I talk to a, an IT director or security uh, director, that's the conversation that comes up. And, and you know, I, I think it's a fantastic model and, and it's one that we that certainly can be implemented. It's just a way, how do we, um, we have to take it down the path of, of multiple technologies are also ultimately going to support this and multiple, you know, the, at the end of the day. And then, um, well, let me take a step back. Multiple technologies are going to support this um, and then ultimately implement these policies across the PEPs um, in order to, to manage and effectively enforce that, that policy. Um, and it's just really, how do we get there? That's, they, they, they love the concept. It's how do we get there? And, and that's a, um, a much larger question. And there's a lot of, of, of conversations out there that could, that could steer that. But that's, that's, Jason, I would say that's probably the best, the, the, the most common question I get, which is great. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. There's, there's a great desire and I think a, a recognized necessity for enterprises to move to this higher level type of vocabulary for expressing these types of policies, moving away from the very sparse or very uh, impoverished vocabulary of a firewall, which is source IP address and target IP address, and moving it to this type of very rich and very dynamic policy model. And then mapping that to business requirements, which are ultimately brings the business into a partnership with security and really helps in many cases accelerate the journey to zero trust. And then having these distributed policy enforcement points that can then make sense of this at scale and at speed without requiring human intervention. And that's really, again, how Zero Trust can break down these silos and make organizations so much more resilient and more effective, which is so desperately needed today. 100% agree, 100%. So I think the, the 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 next thing we're going to do is is we're gonna we're gonna dive deeper into our four architectures. Um, really talk about how those architectures work. What are the PDP behind it? What are the PDP behind it to help drive some of that additional conversation? Just to gain some value of, of what's there. Yeah, I think I, I agree. The, the, when we look at the four deployment models, which we'll do in the next video in this series, we, it really lets us balance out the different pros and cons of each of those things uh, in a way that still product and vendor neutral, uh, but lets you understand, okay, if I deploy my policy enforcement points here, here's the pros and cons, and here's the way that I can even mix and match some of these deployment models together to help arm you when you're looking at this for your enterprise with the knowledge of, okay, in this type of environment, I've got this type of technology, and it probably makes sense to do things this way over here, you know, but here maybe we just need to take a simple approach and get it done quickly because we've got bigger problems over here. Absolutely. All right. Well, I uh, want to say thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you on our uh, next video in the series. We're looking forward to it. As always, Jerry, it's a pleasure. Always fun, Jason. Appreciate it.